theme of July. It is the glory of God to come see the matter, to so times matter is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. Remove the dross from the silver, and the silver is left to produce the vessel. Remove wicked officials from the king's presence, and his throne will be established. Through righteousness, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence, and do not claim a place among his great men. It is better for him to say to you, Come out here, than it is for him to humiliate you before his nobles. What you have seen with your eyes, do not bring me as to support, for what you will do in the end, if you never pursue to shame. If you take your neighbor to court, do not betray another's confidence, or the one who hears it may shame you, and the charge against you will stand. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a ruling variety of heaven. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold it is the rebuke of the wise judge to the same here. Like a snow cool drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who saved him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. Like a tiresome river without rain is one who boasts of death in the given. This is the word of the Lord. Practical with daily life. 
This morning we're looking at chapters 25 to chapter 29. And a little bit like a box of chocolates, uh, there are a few proverbs that are little personal favourites of mine. And the coffee greens go first, the chewy coffees never go. And some of my favourites occur in these five chapters we're looking at this morning. Some of the favourites because they shine so well with reality. Others are favourites because they've just really been helpful for me again and again over the years. Some are favourites just because they're fine. You know what? One of the ways the Bible teaches us that God uses it is through humour. And I'm going to use myths along with the impact of Scripture by reading the straight text. So let the humour of Scripture be, and some of it is in So what I'm going to do to start with this morning, I'm going to show you a few of my little favourites that are in these five chapters. It's a little hobby horse excursion time for me. So let's start with chapter 25, verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. But this tells you how important self-control is. You can have all the right values in life, priorities, ambitions, but if you don't have the self-control, the discipline to live those out, you are no different from a beautiful, architecturally amazing, wealthy, interesting city that has no defences to keep the events out. Or chapter 26, verse 12. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Now, as you read through the book of Proverbs, you discover various categories of people. And one contrast about a game again is the contrast between the wise person and the fool. And uh, you come to realize it's good to be wise, but it's bad to be foolish. And you start to think, maybe there's nothing worse than being a fool. Well, this verse tells you there is a more precarious thing than being a fool. More precarious than being a fool is to be wise in your own eyes. A person who thinks they have nothing to learn from anybody else because they know their right is in a very dangerous place indeed. <coughs> Chapter 26, verse 17, I like this one. It's both humorous and useful. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. How easily, especially in the era of social media, do you find yourself joining in somebody else's argument? Not yours at all. But you just can't resist the piling of your opinion from something that has nothing to do with you. Chapter 27, verse 12. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. There we go. Two captures of people, the contrast, the prudent and the simple. Both have the experience of times in life when if you carry on along the path you're on, you are heading for trouble. Both have the experience in life of observing that if they carry on along the path they're on, they will get into some trouble. So the difference between the proof and the simple is not that your life sometimes heads into danger. It's not that you'll notice that's about to happen. The difference is the simple just keep going. The proof change direction. Chapter 27, verse 14. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbour early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. When I was an undergraduate student, there was someone in our University Christian Union who always had this beaming, broad smile, loud voice, always cheerful. He was such a pleasure to be around because he just brightened the room by walking in. Except, if it is the University of Richard Union's residential time away, it's 7.30 in the morning and you're glaringly peering into your bowl of breakfast, which you not normally eat in company with other people. And suddenly, that extremely enthusiastic morning is not quite the blessing that it might be at another time of the day. 
chapter 29, verse 14. Uh, sorry, chapter 29, verse 24. The accomplices of thieves are their own enemies. They are put under oath and dare not testify. But if you be a thief, that's a bad thing. But if you find, and find yourself helping someone who is a thief, what happens if you get caught? The only way to get yourself off the hook is to say it wasn't really the driving this, it was the scary down on the road. But that's the one thing you dare not do. And so you cannot get yourself off the hook without getting yourself into danger so that you go down to somebody else's trouble. So do not join in the misdemeanors of others, or you will end up taking the rat, not them. And in chapter 19, 29, verse 26, many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. So we have a new president elect in the United States of America. We've relatively recently the Prime Minister of the UK. What happens? Everybody wants an appointment. They want to present their petition, present their cause, try and get the thing they care about made law. And this says that's probably a good thing to do. Yeah, to curry political favour, but realise that ultimately, if what you want is justice and things to be improved, your real vote is the Lord God. And don't expect your political views to ultimately change and the security so there you go, there are some of my favourite products from these five chapters, but as I read those through, nicer they are, I can't stop thinking there has to be more to the book of Proverbs than a little box of chocolates where you get to pick out your own personal things. so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look together at how you can enjoy these Proverbs, okay I'm not trying to take the fun out and say that it's hard how they work how we can benefit from their really practical wisdom but at the same time, how we can hear them as the scriptures and so encounter the voice of God in these problems. And if we're to read them aright and have those things, then there are three things I want to show us from these chapters this morning about how they work for us. So, number one, Proverbs are contextual. Proverbs are contextual. So, look at these two Proverbs. They were part of our, one of our readings. <coughs> Chapter 26, verse 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Which is it? Answer a fool according to his folly? Don't answer a fool according to his folly. You read those two, they're actually next to each other, you go, I don't know. It all depends on the context and the situation. There are times when showing someone that they're wrong will involve necessarily descending to their level. If someone is arguing on and on about something really unimportant and trivial, if you try and persist at showing them that they're wrong until you win the argument, you have just descended to the level of arguing on and on about something really unimportant, so just walk away. There are other times when saying nothing could leave them, and more importantly, other people thinking they're right, and you have to say something. Now, we need that wisdom, don't we, when it comes to navigating the world of social media. Pastor Lee explained a little while ago for us the difference between a promise and a principle. A promise says, if you do this thing, I guarantee this will be the outcome for you. A principle says this will generally be the outcome. Yeah, that's cartoon. Just, so just how many times do you find yourself, just think about that class, you, you see something, someone says something on Facebook, whatever, it's wrong. You gotta make a judgment call. What do you do? Do you say, no, I'm going to reply, I'm going to try and show why that's wrong? Or do you say nothing? And many of you have observed what happens if someone replies and replies and replies and never lets go. And then we aren't going to do that, I'm just going to say nothing. But sometimes you have to say something. You've got to work it out. Right, promises, principles, okay? Different consequences, they're not 
hard and fast. From the due to the will follow to a hard and fast concept. So here's the point. Proverbs are not laws. Proverbs are not laws. God has given us many laws. And what happens is, wisdom fits in the gaps left by those laws. So the law says, do not steal. The law says, do not bear false witness. What about being an accomplice to steal? Well, pretty obvious that that's also wrong. But that's not the only commandment in play here, because we just looked at 29 and 24, which says that being an accomplice to steal would be unwise. Because it could lead you to a point where you're under pressure to give false witness in court. Or take this example. You see how wisdom fits in the gaps? The law tells you the, the black and white things to do, but then the little decisions in between. The law is going to dictate the little choices to help you work out how to put those laws into practice. Here's another example of a contextual proverb. Okay? 26, 17. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel not their own. Now, in case you missed it, this last week the Archbishop of Canterbury resigned. And I'm going to make no comment on that. And I haven't done any point this week. Why not? Like one who rushes into a quarrel not their own. I belong to this church. I love it. We're angry with it. But Justin Welby has never been our official. So, it's not my quarrel. So, let's just say quiet. However, if you are the official of Rwanda and you lead the global family of Anglicans called Gatham, very good, thorough and right and proper for him to make a comment. In fact, wrong to remain silent. And by the way, look up his statement online. What a wonderful, grace-soaked, gentle, sensitive, compassionate statement he offers that brings the grace of God into his mess, whilst remaining very, very clear. So, in Proverbs, the consequences were given, they're not hard and fast. And the wise actions were given. They're not hard and fast rules. They're potential for you to work out and live. Number two, proverbs are cryptic. Proverbs are cryptic. That is to say, you have to think about them. So here are two quite similar proverbs. Chapter 25, verse 16. If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it, and you will vomit. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you, and they will hate you. Now, that's not hard to understand, is it? Okay, if you eat too much honey, you will feel sick. And if you keep eating too much honey beyond that point, you will be sick. Similarly, if you find a next-door neighbor whose company you hope you enjoy, if you are around them too much, they will get sick of you. And if you're around there too much longer after that, they will throw you out. No more honey for you. All right, how about this one? Chapter 25, verse 27. It is not good to eat too much honey, nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too deep. What's that about? Too much honey. Okay, I'll get that. But what does he mean to search out matters of duty? And why is that not honourable? And more to the point, how is that like honey? You're going, I'm going to have to think about this. And actually, I'm still not sure. Me? I don't know. So maybe it's saying this, that Pursuing knowledge and understanding of the world God has made, that's a good thing to do. But if you pursue that too hard and keep seeking because you think that becoming a real expert in some way will give you a great reputation, stop. It won't give you a great reputation. It won't be honourable for you. In which case, this probably about too much of a good thing. Too much honey. 
pretty much so for the moment. Or maybe there's a slight translation issue with this verse in that the word nor is actually not there. They added it to make sense of it. So maybe it's a contrast, okay? Too much honey, well that's a good thing. But there's no such thing as too much pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. Maybe it's contrast. Either way, the honey is a reminder. So every time you have a piece of toast with some honey, you are either warned not to try and be like God, or you're being encouraged never to tire of learning from God. They're cryptic, you have to think about it. And even after thinking about that proverb all week, I still not practice it. Proverbs are a bit like the parables of Jesus. They're designed to make you think. They're designed to get you under your skin, get under your skin and impact no other pictures out there. You're about to find out. If the parables of Jesus, if what you want is a good story, then you'll listen to the parables of Jesus and you'll go away entertained with nothing more. But if you go away and ponder, think, reflect, Think about that slight surprise twist in the end you hadn't seen coming. <coughs> then you'll see the point. The parable gets under your skin and you go away changed by it. Proverbs are the same. They need reading slowly. Now, as we started this preaching series in Proverbs, we threw out the Proverbs challenge for you. A number of famous Christians have done and do this. Um, Billy Graham, John Piper, others. So 31 chapters of the Proverbs, 31 days in many months. One on each day, read through the chapter number today. So today we read through chapter 17. And as I asked that, you can have this a couple of media videos ago. Um, some, one, one in response to the preaching series, one that already been trying it. Let me commend that to you again. It's a good thing to do. It's really a blessing to you. You don't let me... Um, uh, rain on your parade, I would like that to say. But I suspect if you've been trying this, you might discover that you've been getting some interest. What do I mean? Chapter 27, chapter 17, today's chapter, contains 28 verses. Now, again, when I asked Danny you about this, the number of hands that went up in the room was most of them. If someone gave you a box of chocolates, do you think you could eat 28 of them at a sitting? And most of our teenagers said, I, a wise man, once said something about eating too much honey. But Proverbs, now this is not original to me, it's a friend of mine, I can't but I like it, so I'll share it with you. The book of Proverbs is not so much like a box of chocolates, it's more like a box of gobsolders. Now, in case you haven't met these before, these are boiled sweets, typically about two inches in diameter. They're made slowly because they contain uh, many, many, many layers of different colour and flavour of sugar. So that as you suck them, the different flavours come through as you work your way through to the middle of the sweet. They're big, they're very hard. If you try and bite on them, they will break your teeth. So the only way to eat them is to pop it in your mouth and suck it slowly. I don't think I missed a trick this morning. I'm sure you all three things you can. A sermon outline, Proverbs of the Year, and a golf soccer. But don't put it in the after set, otherwise the singing will be very muffled. Indeed. <coughs> the point is this, you can't chew over 28 puzzles in a day. You just can't. So instead of taking a chapter of Proverbs a day, how about taking a proverb a day? And if you divide the book of Proverbs up into that kind of text, it takes about a year to get through. So maybe that's a chapter of what we do. Go away, read one or two a day. Take it into the day you do, memorize if that's helpful, and supplement. And as you go through the day, look for opportunities to apply the wisdom of that proverb to the very different challenges that that particular day will present for you. Proverbs are critical. And number three, proverbs are covenantal. What? Well, maybe they had to put in the Proverbs of Christian. And you want a different seat. But I'll, I'll try and show you how they're Christian. Okay? So Proverbs are coming up. But because you read the book of Proverbs, that sound terribly Christian, okay? They sound more like your grandmother's top tips for life. Now, there's a reason for this. It's to do with how the book of Proverbs came about. 
Half the book program comes out, to all half, but if no one said, I need to write a book program, because my publisher is giving me a deadline, so I'm going to think of 500 of these by the next, by next March, I better start having some ideas. No. What happens is this, you have an experience in life, and you learn the lesson from it. Okay? You go across the road, and you nearly get run over by a, a bus that is coming across. And you start to learn it's a good idea to um, uh, listen to the traffic and have a look, check on the tone before you stop it across the room. So what do you do? You start to go, you, you remember this, you go, okay, next time I'm going to look, I'm going to stop, I'm going to look, and I'm going to listen. And in fact, you start passing on to other people. But eventually, several generations later, people who have never met you are saying, stop, look, and listen. They've never heard of the number eight bus, because that service shut down centuries before. By that point, they've never heard of you. But your little life experience gave rise to a pithy phrase that they get passed on and on until it finds its way into this book. That's why these problems just come across as earthly wisdom that's not desperately Christian. And it's a good thing it's not all in Christian language. Because it shows you that faith in God is not just all about being religious, and it's not just all about the big choices in life that your faith will work out in the practical choices, even the money. But still, why is Proverbs in the Bible? Well, the first thing to say is that Proverbs may be at times a bit mundane, but Proverbs actually is Jesus' wisdom. So chapter 25, verse 1, these are more prophets of Solomon, compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. This is how chapter 25 to 29 came to exist. Hezekiah was a king who ruled just before Jerusalem was sent to exile to Babylon. And Hezekiah was a good king, he restored God's temple, he restored God's law, but this verse shows that he didn't do just do that. He also restored God's wisdom. He got his men to seek out Solomon's proverbs that got lost and to write them down. Which means one of the messages of these chapters is this. It matters that the people of God do not forget this wisdom. As Jesus came on the scene, he introduced himself as one greater than Solomon. He's wiser than Solomon. So this is not just your granny's tips, these are Jesus' tips. And indeed, chapter 25, verse 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Do you recognize that? It's Romans 12, verse 20, which is there talking about how do you respond if you persecute you to follow Jesus? Jesus is wisdom. Chapter 27, verse 1, do not boast about tomorrow. You do not know what a day may bring. That's Matthew 6, verse 34. This really is Jesus' is wisdom. But more than that, it's covenant wisdom. You see, the book of Proverbs is not just chapters 25 to 29. The book of Proverbs is not even just chapters 10 to 31. Do you remember how the book of Proverbs that uh, started back in chapter 1 and verse 7. <coughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You get something quite similar in chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now we looked at chapter 9 a few weeks ago, and you remember it offers you a choice. Will you live your life in the house of folly on the road to death? Or will you live your life in the house of wisdom on the road to life? And now that Jesus has come, that choice, the road to death or the road to life, becomes will you reject Jesus or will you live for Jesus? And if you want to live for the glory of Jesus, Proverbs will help you. But the book of Proverbs will also help people who don't want to live for Jesus, because there's much ordinary wisdom here. If you want to live in the kingdom of Queen Folly, Proverbs will contain much good advice on how to do that really excellent. 
The trouble is, the house of the fallen still leads to death. So no matter how successful you are at living in that house, it doesn't actually really help you. It's a little bit like catching a flight from Leeds Bradford Airport to Tenerife. You might see a bit of autumn sunshine, so you get on the plane. Leeds Bradford to Tenerife. And if you're watching this from Tenerife, you know who you are and have a very nice time. Okay. Check in is a two minute. And you execute your trip to the airport perfectly. Your bags are packed, they are the correct weight and size, and you can have everything that you need in there. Yes, it's November, you have some sun cream in your bag. You plan your route to the airport and time to perfection. And you arrive exactly at 2 p.m. at Manchester Airport. Immaculately delivered to the wrong destination. Well, it's not if you want to live in the house of Queen Folly, but that's hardly an achievement, is it? Proverbs are covenantal. They are there so that the people of the living God can have this help. For the live for Jesus, really. <coughs> so, Proverbs is a very tasty book. But it's not a box of chocolates to pick your favourite tips for life. It is so much more. And here is how we enjoy it for the book. Start with Jesus. There's good advice here for anyone. But this book was compiled by the King to help his people live their lives in the house of wisdom, under the shadow of his good and gentle rule, to his praise and glory. Make sure your life is on the road to life. Then take these prophets one at a time and suck on that oil sweet as it slowly dissolves. Sure. Turn them over, carry them through the day. The day will bring many and varied situations, and prayerfully seek out how each one gives you the wisdom you need for the many and different situations that you face. That's right. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the ultimate wise one. And you invite us to come and live in the house of wisdom with you and enjoy life in all its fruits. Thank you for giving us this book of Proverbs to equip us to do just that. And we pray that you would indeed do that. That you would write this wisdom into our souls, soak it into our very being, so that as we seek to live for you through all the challenges of life, we will become really, really wise like you at doing this.